Free run episode 11. Free run absolutely humiliating Aura, the gu guillotine, guillotine. Pretty successful day for the trio. I was just praying. That's something she picked up too. Aura kind of defeated herself. Yeah, huge cost. The prayer thing is something we saw in a flashback. Everyone was vocally against it, if I recall. But here she is praying. Although I talk about God a lot, I'm really not religious at all. But the older I get, the more I think about it, the more I find like secular motivations for things I once thought were in the realm only of religion and faith. At the very least, there's nothing wrong or harmful about praying. At the best, it's an opportunity to like reflect, to go deeper, meditate on the poignance, poignancy of life and the meaning of others' lives, gratitude, honing in on one's true desires, humility, etc., etc. Yeah, it doesn't really feel like much to celebrate. Or celebrate solemnly. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering what's the deal with the dependents. It's like their dog tags. But the flashback from last episode has revealed anything. Freerun was set up by Flan. She inherited the lineage of Overkill. Flan and Freerun both seem to have a grudge not only against demons but against like the whole forest. Trees and wild animals just collateral damage. Wow, she's learning. And you know that means everything to them. Also, they crushed it. Like they deserve it. And there it is. <laughs> Father. Or son, son, my bad. Father was Lugner. Or so he said. The village's food is about to get a whole lot better. You got any books? That'll do it. That is a book. That's it. So you knew, and you still tried to pass it off. It's hard to even piece the show apart because there's just so many things happening at the same time. It's so complexly interwoven. But it's not just a journey to reconnect with Himmel and her Demon King slaying party, is it? It also seems like a journey to reconnect with Flam and Freerun's whole past and everything that she is. It's like she woke up as an adult and then had to like retrace or become conscious of how she got here so she can know how she wants to proceed. Which I would argue is very human journey. Being born into this material state with these parameters based on your, your upbringing and parentage and early environment and your most pressing needs to survival. Accumulating something of a, a base of personality so that you can now navigate more or less automatically, like being able to control Nen or mana in your sleep to free up the intellectual resources where you can then go back and like look at what those things are and then more actively choose what you want to be and who you are. It's hard to pin it down to like a moment, right? But I think there is usually some kind of awakening, at least period in there, where you become aware that you can be aware. You become aware that there are choices. And now that I think about it, weirdly, kind of creating a metaphor for humans in the universe itself, like consciousness emerging out of the material separately, but more related to the show and its characters. Total speculation. Does anyone else get the feeling that we're not getting the full story about Flam? That there's some question marks there for Freerun. I just get this odd vibe that she really loves Flam, but has some issues with her and is trying to reconcile those two things. To that extent, I wonder if we'll get any clues in what she helps Fern avoid or what she doesn't show to Fern. <laughs> <laughs> a bad experience of his own. Oh, the executioner has arrived. <laughs> That's terrifying. The timing of that. Wow. I think I was huge. I need an axe. They're moving him like you you move items in uh Skyrim. Everyone likes the sound of taking your time. This is big for them. This is huge for them. It's a turning point now. I mean, the dragon was big. Fern has fought enemies before, but this feels like just a different level. They were on their own against really powerful enemies, and they handled it. Also, the size of those burgers, proportional to the piece in the town, I guess. Oh, musical montage. Been a while. Is that, that's what priests do, isn't it? Healing and protective magic. This was this guy just lurking. There's not even any trees. Freeran going for the books. Stark always good with kids. Oh yeah, and they get a chance to really bask in the good they've affected, like a nice peaceful town. Damn, what a memorial. Do they not get statues? <laughs> I 
for like, shut up, shut up, <laughs> let us go, please. It's been 12 years. I mean, Freeran's gonna have to do the hardest thing for her. Name drop. Oh, do we need to take the hunter exam? But like, you can get an honorary hunter license. I feel like Freeran's automatic. Well, this whole time she's been acting illegally. Third rank. Probably leveled up by now. Time to retest. <laughs> That's not a huge shock. Yeah, and like, who, who gets to decide what mage is above Freerun that they can tell Freerun she's worthy of being a mage? This can be a frustrating thing about society, I guess, though I don't really have any other solution. Appeal to authority is, is an informal fallacy. There is no added logical or truth value to any information or ideas simply because of the fact that it comes from somebody recognized by someone as an authority. It's one of the most pervasive logical pitfalls I see, you know, like people will tell you someone said something when trying to establish a point, when really what they should be doing is arguing the point. It's difficult because not everyone can specialize in everything or even one thing a lot of the time. So it's really resource intensive to question everything all the time. You know, you just want to have someone who has studied it more tell you what it is. But man, do authorities get it wrong all the time in like really significant ways. It's also tough because you might have great ideas or great gifts, but no certification, at which point people are very quick to tune you out. The good news, I guess, is that there are substitutes for credentials. Like if you just have extreme, extreme expertise and you have something really tangible to show for your gift, then people will start to pay attention. You figure that's the case for free rent. Yeah, a lot of it's going to be bureaucracy too. Although, everything I said is kind of cynical. It, it could go well. It does go well sometimes. Sometimes it is what we want it to be. That was predictable. Every 50 years. Jeez, which moves at light speed. How do you keep track? Well, we've come this far without it. We really don't need to, but... Alright, I guess it makes travel more convenient. Hunter exam! <laughs> I'm a really stupid and weird parallel to this. I somehow got into university without taking any standardized exams. I'm still not even really clear how I managed this, but I got into university by like swarming into the admissions office and like begging for a spot when the semester had already started. But then I wanted to transfer, so I, I took my SAT when I was already enrolled in university and had a 4.0. It felt ridiculous. Understatement. I mean, yeah, yeah, you better not. The seasons are changing. Oh. Oh, that's seems historically accurate for like, historical wars. Stark spends a lot of time dead. I'm sure you got a spell for this. Episode 11, Winter in the Northern Lands. All those spells, you don't have like a compass spell? I don't think he's coming back. Is that like a flashback to the restaurant scene with the ice cream? Doubt. <laughs> this, I mean, this is not really a crap. I don't, who cares? Whatever. After all we've seen from Freerun, I think she could manage. I think she could probably manage enough mana to resist the wind. I think she just wants Fern to work out her legs. The axe might be half of it. Oh boy, the, the delirium, bringing out that awkward honesty. Man, who can keep track of the emergency stations? They change them so fast. Emergency stations moving at light speed. How do demons fare in extreme snow and winter? Oh, hi. Is that an elf? I like him already. Free, free, free run boyfriend? <laughs> you got no other choice. It's him or no one, apparently. Why? What didn't you like about what you saw? Because he's shirtless? Damn, how shelter, sheltered is she? He's got pants on. Could have been way worse. That's what I'm saying. Is this or this species is extinct. As I said, when she said that like their species are dying off and don't breed, it, it's like weird. We don't really think about it for animals like pandas, but I don't know. You're a human-ish species. Like, I don't know. So we got so much in common. 
Okay, this actually like clears up a point of confusion I had. In a lot of shows, the races correspond to the ability. So like sometimes elves just are like the mage class and dwarves are like the strong brutish class, but it seems like they're just two different things. There's race and ability. Oh, they got a, we got a monk class. So he uses his fists. Not to laugh at his death, but... Yeah, it is the ice cream. Aww. It's not what you wanted, but... <laughs> it's what you have. Wait for the double take. There it is. Triple take. It wasn't gonna be Fern or Freerun. I know he's old. You could recognize. Yeah, I recognize. Look, let's be real. We all know when guys are attractive. We all know. We all have that sense. There's no shame. Abs are abs. <laughs> I like how Stark was just sold by the abs. I'm gonna go kill animals with my fists. Oh, it got food. Food I procured with my fists. Anime has me so like on edge. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. But I really hope he's just a good, good cool dude. <laughs> How? How does not everyone not? Yeah, right. How does everyone not know Freerun? Nice, getting some training in. So that's like they really got to know each other then. Though we, the audience, maybe didn't. Right, I was about to say, she's got that upbringing. He's coming up again. She says that despite praying. Maybe you just don't know where to look. This admittedly, I think, one of the weaker or less personally appealing motivations for me. This plays very, very heavily into the whole story and, like, who will remember your legacy. I don't know. I'm not an authority. I don't have any religious credentials. I laid out my heaven idea early in the series to try to briefly summarize. I believe that the universe has both a will and a, a sort of objective scale of good and bad, and humans have a choice to contribute. Contributing to which it is like, by definition, the, the highest possible goal and the only thing from which meaning can possibly stem, because without that objective structure from which we're born, what other structure would there be? Heaven is something like being an eternal part of that in a positive way, and hell is something like being an eternal part of that in a negative way. But it's happening right now. It's in your choices day to day. As crushing a weight as that thought can be, it's also the key to glory. Putting aside the sort of like far out there spiritual stuff to take the same template of an idea and make it very hands-on and personal I think there's this natural feeling that people have that like we're building towards the good time Like we're building towards the best time of our lives later And if we only get XYZ out of the way then we'll be able to live in this sort of glory state in our lifespan Like you do all the hard work now you live a life that contains misery or maybe is full of misery depending on your outlook And that's your price to pay for the future that is glorious and perfect And I can see some potential positives in there like you know Sometimes it is important to sacrifice the present moment for the future but the idea that the idealized state or that like the life you want or the feeling that everything is good and that you're really tuned in and optimized for life is somewhere out there, I think, contains a, a massive pitfall, which is that you only have this time right now. I would guess most people can channel enough experience in their lives to know that at some point there is something you wanted and you told yourself when you had that, you would start having that life and then you got that thing but it did not lead to that idealized life. You just found more things to desire and more ways to push off that ideal life towards the future. If it's gonna happen, it needs to happen now. This is really it. Like to rush through all these things to get to some other point. I mean, you're gonna get there and realize you rushed through and missed the most beautiful thing there ever was and could be, which is just like your life and being alive, which is not to take anything away from people's material problems. Like those are also real. It can be both. But I don't like these things that are non-life affirming or, or life denying. Like heaven is where the good time is or the future is where the good time is. It's like heaven could be now. It's no coincidence 
since I think that this is coming up for me right now, I don't know exactly what triggered it, but about a month ago, I was kind of just stepping back and looking at, you know, the, the last year or so, this current snapshot of my life from a little bit more of a zoomed out place. And what I came to see is that there's this dominant current of thought in my mind that just replays over and over in a loop about how I should be doing more or if I only continue what I'm doing, I'm going to drop off a cliff. I haven't realized all my goals. I don't know if I can realize all my goals. But then interestingly, coupled with the fact that actually among almost any metric I can think of, I'm like in the perfect moment of time in my life. Like everything is going well. I don't talk a lot about the specifics of my current life and I don't mean this to sound like a brag in any way. I have a life that I think 99.9% .9 of people would kill for. I think anxiety, I think drive, desire can be a wonderful thing if it's spurning action. Like if that's a push to do something great and to grow, that's one thing. But if it's just like you ruminating by yourself about the things you're not doing or the ways you're failing and it doesn't really change anything, it really serves no purpose. It's probably better to just ride things out and enjoy. Regain a grip on that focal lens and focus it on how everything actually is, is going well. The problems are solvable. The material things can get better. They can also get worse. That will ebb and flow throughout your lifetime. But like you don't want to miss your lifetime. You don't need to put it off into the future. You don't need a heaven to believe in to experience that beauty. Just looking for someone to believe in, I guess. That's very, very him. Interesting. Oh wow, she had the same conversation. Neither has. Oh, see, strong no. Real, recognize real, etc. And just wants her attention. <laughs> How is everyone in the show so clairvoyant? I only found a way around that. That's what the orphans are for. That, I phrase that horribly. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's an example of like taking his experience, even negative things, and using that to inform his good deeds. Like he's talking about heaven and believing in the goddess and stuff, but like he's also creating that very thing himself on earth now. <laughs> okay, interesting answer. I think she does in her way. Oh yeah, that. I'm very telling she phrased it that way. Well, if Himmel doesn't get to heaven, who does? Wait, would we need to date? <laughs> and that's the end of the species. Just like that. Just like pandas. Just let him go. <laughs> Look, if you want to be extinct that badly, you do you. I guess. Maybe it's just my reading, but I think that's kind of where the show is going. It's like they're worshipping the goddess, but it's more of a symbol or just a spiritual way of connecting with concepts that very tangibly affect themselves now in this life and in the relationships and connections with other people. Their motivations, their desires, their focal point, their ideological and spiritual orientation. And maybe that is the real practical use of faith and spirituality to like inform and, and connect in ways that have a ripple effect beyond your life, if not an afterlife, just in the legacy that you create. Well, I'm glad he ended up being cool. Though we didn't really get to know him that well. <laughs> Maybe he'll come back around. He was a very intriguing character, had a lot of promise and potential. But at least in this episode, he kind of just existed as a vehicle for Freerin to explore her thoughts about spirituality and some flashbacks. I don't think it really matters what the approach is, what the philosophical or ideological introduction is to ideas, but I do believe that there is, like I've said, an objective-ish structure of good and bad. It can be difficult sometimes to pin it down to any particular situation or course of action because life is so complex. Nevertheless, I think a common understanding or agreement on what is good and bad as it pertains to humans emerges organically through society and works of art and media and personal interactions. There's like an overarching essence that permeates. And so I think the judge of someone's beliefs is not the names or the particulars of their belief, but like what does that create in you and how applicable is it? How universal is the essence behind it? Is it something self-serving or is it in some way a denial of truth for the sake of convenience? Or is it open? Is it expansive? Does it lead to giving and creation and contribution? Drawing from personal experience and looking at people who are both deeply religious and deeply atheist, I see examples of both extremes throughout all denominations. No one school of thought has a monopoly on virtue, no monopoly on truth, and I would argue no monopoly on God. There are many roads to the same path. Here you have Hyder, who's a literal priest, and he's very devout, and he believes in the goddess, 
this and he prays to it. And whether anyone agrees with that or disagrees with that, the result of that is like he's a good man who took his pain of being an orphan to help other people, to use his gifts and his love and his faith to contribute to like the greatness of the world. Probably in many ways also, like you imagine his faith was a big contributor towards his courage and strength to fight and defeat the Demon King. Like you give me someone like that, I don't care what their stated beliefs are, I don't care what they label themselves as. And I think that becomes increasingly important as at least I feel I see in my lifetime, people get increasingly more label dependent, label and faction dependent. I also feel like if you're oriented towards just wanting the best for people and you're hungry for information, like with the lion turtle thing, you can engage and play with the ideas from any number of things without being dominated or controlled by them or ruled by them or like a slave to them. You can pray and not be religious. You know, you can read the Bible and not be Christian. I think as long as the underlying motivation is like a real search for truth and maybe just a, a regard or love for humanity and a recognition of beauty of the world, or at least a desire to contribute to the beauty of the world, I don't think you can really get it wrong. Thank you.